Philippe, the floor is yours. I'll let you know when there are five minutes left. Okay. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much for this very nice introduction. And let me tell you that first of all, it's my first time in Palma de Mallorca. So I'm very happy for that. And also I'm very honored to be um, invited to speak uh, to such a wide audience. So indeed, I want to tell you about the possible bridges between complex systems and behavioral economics, in particular, what's called bounded rationality. So I've changed a little bit my title, but you know, it's, it's going to be the same content. So this is some work which has been done over many years with many people, PhD students and uh, more senior researchers like Francesco Zamponi and Marco Tarsia and Michael Benzaken, but the PhD students are Jérôme Garnier, uh, Théo de Certain, Jose Moran, and Dhruv Sharma. <coughs> Okay, so maybe you know, but the, the standard law in economics is that we are rational agents. We have rational expectations about the future, which means that our decisions, even if based on probability theory, of, of, if, if, even if our view of the world is probabilistic, our views are compatible with the actual realization of the future. But of course, you know, how can we really be rational in such a complex and uncertain world that is surrounded uh, around us. <clears throat> and this is a, a long story that has been discussed since the 20s by Knight, Keynes, uh, Herbert Simon, which I'm going to, uh, whom I'm going to quote later, Nassim Taleb, and maybe you've heard about people speaking about radical uncertainty, black swans, unknown unknowns, and so this is something that uh, uh, Donald Rumsfeld said in 2002 about the Iraq war. There are known knowns. These are things that we know that we know. There are known unknowns. This is to say there are things that we know we don't know, but that there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we don't even know we don't know. So, you know, it's a, it's a big problem, of course. And what I want to tell you today is how the field of complex systems sheds light on some of these uh, issues. Okay, so you know, in the face of this problem of uh, of rationality being difficult to apply, because if you you know if you imagine what it means, it means that we are supposed to be rational, optimizing our welfare, but in order to do that, we have to assume what's called common knowledge. That is, we have to assume that others do the same. You know, I know that you know, and you know that I know that you know, and so on. And we also are faced usually with extremely complex problems to solve. And I'm going to quote, for example, portfolio optimization, which is one of the most common things the financial engineers have to deal with. But even that, you'll see, has uh, complex properties. So, you know, how to deal with that? And if you think about uh, chess, for example, we know that even chess champions, they can't be fully rational. They have to use some intuition or heuristic at one point. There's also this strange theory, in my view, which is called mean field games, that you know, is, is a mathematical theory that allows to deal with many agents trying to uh, solve a problem, taking into account their interactions. And this mean field games have been applied, for example, to crowds and to the way crowds exit uh, rooms in the case of dangers. And to me, it's very, very hard to imagine that the crowd that you see here in Mecca, in, in the case of an uh, imminent danger, is going to act rationally. That is, is going to orient the global flow to exit the square in a way that optimizes the time to exit for everybody, taking into account what everybody else is doing. I think it's a very dangerous idea. But anyway, so Herbert Simon. Uh, who got the Nobel Prize in economics, actually, back in the 60s, proposed something that he called bounded rationality. He said that, okay, we are trying to be rational, but we really can't get to it completely. So what we're doing is we're using what he called satisficing solutions, which is a mixed word, but a proper word, which is constructed with satisfying and sufficing. Okay, so we, and I'll give examples of that. So we, we are not necessarily finding the best solution, but we are finding a solution that is okay. 
but still economists tend to want to stick with the idea of uh, strict rationality and the reason is what they call the wilderness the jungle of bounded rationality and the argument is that there are many ways to be boundedly rational but there's only one way to be rational so they argue that we should stick to that because the rational choice model disciplines researchers in their modeling of economic phenomena and so on top of that there's a kind of strange argument which is the as if argument we're going to compute everything uh, uh, assuming people are rational and then we're going to say well maybe they're not rational but you know in aggregate for example in aggregate maybe individually we're not rational but in aggregate things go as if we were rational and frankly I'm, I'm a little frightened by these type of arguments and I'll come back to that also later another argument for rationality that I'll discuss <clears throat> okay so let me move to complex systems by first reminding you um, what physics was about in the 18, in the 19th century, essentially, you know, very simple uh, systems, deterministic trajectories. But then at the, uh, at the dawn of the 20th century, people started realizing that actually even very simple dynamical systems are chaotic, which means that errors in the initial conditions or in the parameters describing the system grow exponentially with time. And this is called the, the, the butterfly effect. You know, everybody has heard about this proverbial uh, butterfly effect. So if you look at Sinai's billiard, which is a very simple example of these chaotic systems, it's a ball that elastically reflects on an inside circle and outside square without losing energy. And this system, as we all know, is, is such that indeed, if you do a very little mistake in the initial condition, then after, say, uh, 10, 10 uh, bounces with the uh, central circle, you've completely lost uh, the trajectory. So individual trajectories are unknowable. They're just impossible to know. But there are probabilities, and this is the whole story of statistical mechanics, I'm not saying anything new here, is that the probabilities can be characterized and are often very simple. So if you lose the idea of characterizing the whole trajectory of this ball in the Sinai Bibia, but actually just ask the question, after a long time, what is the probability to find the ball anywhere in the accessible region? It's extremely simple. It's just a constant, okay? So it could be anywhere with the same probability. And we know that using this, the micro canonical or Boltzmann weights and so on, we can go quite a long way in statistical mechanics. <clears throat> And it's the same with economics. You know, in economics, you're, you're assuming that you don't know, of course, what's going to happen, but you know the probability of what's going to happen. And uh, I'm flashing here a, a formula, just, you know, you don't have to uh, understand the formula, but just see the typical formula that you would write in economics, which relates inflation to the mathematical expectation of the future so-called productivity shocks. So what you assume is that Everybody knows how to take this expectation and everybody agrees on the probability of what's going to happen in the future. Of course, barring these unknown unknowns that I've talked about, which means that, for example, in the 60s, imagining the iPhone was strictly impossible. So how do you actually do this is a mystery. But anyway, so what about complex systems? So here I've drawn a, a kind of uh, energy map of a typical complex system. Here is the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model of spin glasses, which I'm going to discuss quite a bit. So it's a simple model of disordered spins where SI and SJs are plus or minus ones and JIJs are coupling between spins that are random. So this model has a long history and of course was the reason why Giorgio Parisi had the Nobel Prize in last year uh, in physics. <clears throat> So what I want to argue is that complex systems are, in a sense, uh, plagued with a double butterfly effect. So the, the usual butterfly I've discussed, but in the case of complex systems, it turns out that even probabilities chaotically depend on the parameters of the problem or the initial conditions or maybe time. And this chaotic evolution of or the, this chaotic nature of the probability distribution itself is a possible definition of complexity as was actually argued in this 
very nice paper of Giorgio, which is uh, not very well known in 2007. <clears throat> so it means that probabilities themselves are knowable, even if the states of the world are known. So, you know, even if we forget about these unknowns, uh, unknowns, then these probabilities cannot be fully characterized. We have to speak, we have to go to a second level of probabilities. We have to speak about probabilities of probabilities. And to my mind, it's really what Parisi's solution of spin glasses has brought to the fore, that we, we need to, to, to go to a higher level of abstraction. So in this you know, configuration uh, space with this uh, energy landscape, which is extremely um, uh, ruffled and, and chaotic, it turns out that the optimal states or the quasi-optimal state are exponentially numerous in the size of the system. So for example, if there are n spins in the SK model or n degrees of freedom, when I'm going to say exponentially numerous, it means exponentially in n. And so these states are extremely numerous. There are many, many solutions from which you can find, uh, choose from, and but they're also extremely fragile in the sense that I'm going to uh, expand on in a second. So the generic scenario of complex systems is that the number of equilibria, if you want the number of local optima is exponentially large. And these optima are also very different from one, one another. So let me give you here what we did with uh, Jerome in the context of a very simple uh, portfolio optimization problem with a nonlinear constraint, which is that all the weights in your portfolio must be positive. That is, you, you cannot short assets. You have only to own, you can only be long, as, as one says. So what you see here in the x-axis is the, a, a measure of distance, is an overlap between the, actual, the optimal solution, which is this blue point here, which is really the optimum optimorum, um, which of course has an overlap one with itself, a distance zero. And on the y-axis, it's the excess cost or the, you know, the, the best solution is at zero. And then anything above zero is less good than the optimal solution. And the color code here is, gives you how many of these solutions you find. And what you find is that there's a huge number of solutions that are around two equals zero, that is as far as possible from the optimum optimum, with you know only slightly uh, uh, increased cost in in the realization of what we're asking for. <clears throat> so you know we're really at the heart of what Herbert Simon had in mind. I think that the optimum optimum is exponentially difficult to find, so there's no way to find it. But its performance is very close to those of secondary minima. So. These uh, secondary optima, they're really satisfy, satisficing solutions. They're much easier to find. This, these are the ones that you're going to find if you do a simple algorithm. And they're going to be satisfying in the sense that they obey, uh, I mean, they, they give you a performance which is not bad, which is actually quite good. <clears throat> but on top of that, even if you were able numerically to find this optimum optimorum, then it turns out that in these complex systems, these optima are hypersensitive to the parameters of the problem. So for example, in the case of the portfolio construction, what you need is a covariance matrix. And so you need some number of entries of this covariance matrix. But as soon as you change a little bit these entries, then what was the optimum optimorum becomes a, a suboptimal uh, portfolio and vice versa. So it means that the common knowledge assumption that I talked about earlier is just untenable because different people will have different estimates of these parameters and therefore they will find different solutions. So, you know, even rational investors, they will choose completely different portfolios. And from there, it's extremely difficult to assume that everybody is kind of acting the same way and making a theory out of that. Let me tell us to speak about a slightly different subject, but highly co uh, connected, which is what's called marginal stability. So this is a, a kind of generic, but not universal. You can avoid this, uh, this phenomenon, but it's a generic scenario by which the dynamics stops as soon as a stable uh, state is, is reached. 
But it turns out that this stable state is often marginal because it's like, in a sense at the border between unstable and stable state. So this is illustrated here in this diagram. So you start from an unstable state and there's some kind of dynamics, which is maybe a real dynamics. If you think about, I don't know, sand piles, but it can be just your algorithm and your algorithm or the dynamics is going to stop as soon as you, you reach the region of stable states. And the state that you're going to select through this dynamics is, is going to have, again, not necessarily, but very often uh, um, strange properties because they are marginally stable. They're just at the border between stability and instability. So what marginal stability means is technically is that the eigenvalue spectrum of uh, the matrix of the linear stability matrix uh, around the, these uh, marginally stable points touch zero. So this is the illustrated here. All the eigenvalues are positive, which means that the, the, the point is stable, but there are a few that are touching zero, which means that in these directions, it's very easy to move the system and it's, it's easy for the system to escape. So similarly, you know, if you start from a stable state, and you progressively remove constraints, um, then if you think, of, for example, of constraints as legislation or regulation in economic systems, then very often what you end up with is a system that's more efficient in a sense, but also more fragile because it's at the border of instability. So this is a very important trade-off that I think is uh, one of the big problem in economic theory in the coming years is how to estimate and solve the trade-off between efficiency and fragility. By the way, so this uh, marginality is called is often called isostaticity in granular systems. So let me give you a few examples of relevance to economics, for example, but also ecologies. So often it turns out that these equilibrium states that I've talked about they are the solutions of a linear equation of this type, Z times identity minus some uh, matrix applied to a vector of P equals another vector K. And what it turns out is that the equilibrium you're looking for must be positive solutions. That is the vector P must have all positive entries. Why? Because for example, if you're speaking about ecologies, then of course populations, which are represented by this vector P have to be positive. Doesn't mean doesn't make sense to speak about a negative number of uh, fishes, for, for example. So in, in this case, G is the so-called log cavalter interaction matrix. If you have a, a firm network, so this is a, an actual representation of the US input output network where firms exchange suppliers and customers. So for example, these three points here are uh, the automobile, uh, the big automobile makers in the US. And so you see it's a very complex network of uh, what people need from one another or what firms need from one another to uh, uh, produce. And in this case, you again have an equation of this type to uh, characterize equilibrium where P is the vector of prices at which all these companies sell their goods. So of course, prices have to be positive and G is the input output matrix. And then the uh, last example is the example I gave you in the previous slide, uh, the, the optimal portfolio construction, which again has this form. And if you impose long only condition, as I, I said, that is you can only buy stuff and you can't short sell anything, then you have the similar problem. Um, and it turns out that in all these uh, problems where you have to find these positive solutions, there are reasons to believe that the system is going to self-organize at a point where these positive solutions are marginally stable. So for example, in the case of ecologies, uh, it turns out that for so some interaction networks, the number of species is going to spontaneously saturate the famous Robert May bound for this problem so that the log cavalcara dynamics is marginally stable, which leads to mass extinctions and a very special type of dynamics. In the case of economics of these firm networks, there are also reasons to argue that firms will saturate the analog of the ray uh, of the uh, Maybound, which is called the Hawkins Simon, the same Simon, by the way, as the, the one I talked about, Herbert Simon condition. And the fact that these firm networks may be close to marginality means that 
you might have endogenous crises that come from the internal dynamics of the system itself. Okay, so now let me move to uh, a slightly different problem, but uh, which is very important because this is a way out for economists. So a lot of economists say, okay, well, we can't all be rational. So there's the argument that I told you about earlier, which is, okay, maybe we're not individually rational, but as a whole, we act as a collective uh, body of, of rational people. We're acting as if we were rational. There's another way out that has been discussed in the literature more recently and is still very active, which is learning. And so let me read uh, a sentence from a review paper on learning in macroeconomics by Evans and Honka Poya. Uh, in standard macroeconomic models, rational expectations can emerge in the long run, provided the agent's environment remains stationary for a sufficiently long period. Okay, so the idea here is that if the environment remains stable, then people will learn to be rational. Okay, well, Keynes in 36 said in the long run, we're all dead. So, um, so not only you know, this idea here requires very restrictive assumptions about the world. The world has to be stationary. There has to be a, a unique fixed point to this learning and so on. Uh, and as you can anticipate already, I've talked about the fact that these complex systems actually have a lot of stationary points. Um, so maybe under restrictive assumptions, the rational ex expectation equilibrium can be reached through learning. But there's, in any case, a very pressing question that's very rarely discussed in uh, economics uh, papers, which how long does it take physically? You know, uh, you need to learn for 100 years or for 1,000 years or for uh, a month very different. So I'm going to illustrate this idea of learning in a complex environment by two simple models. <clears throat> and of course, the outcome will be that in these simple models, it's actually impossible to learn. So the first model is a model where you have two players playing a complex game. And the second model will be n players playing a binary game. So I'm going to uh, tell you about a model that's been introduced by um, uh, Tobias Gala, who is here, and Doink Farmer. And so the, um, the, 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 the game is the following. So there are two players, Alice and Bob, and they play a game with stable rules. So we're enforcing the fact that reality is, is stationary. And each of these two people, they have n moves if you want to play. So Alice can play anything from I to equal one to N and Bob can play anything from J equal one to N. And every time they play together, I and J, they have a payoff. And this payoff is characterized by two payoff matrices, pi I J A, pi J I B, which means what is the gain of A when she plays I and B plays J and vice versa for B. And in order to make the model tractable and generic, Tobias and Doen have assumed that these are random matrices, if you want. And so you don't have to worry too much about you know, the average gain is zero. What is important is that there's a parameter that characterizes the um, degree of cooperativity of this game. So if the covariance of the gains when they play together I and J is positive, it means that they are going to gain together. So it's a cooperative game. If it's negative, it's a kind of uh, you know competition game. So A and uh, Alice and Bob don't know these payoffs to start with, so they don't exactly know how to play. So they are going to play randomly their strategies, their, their moves, uh, and they are going to make the probability of playing these strategies evolve with time. So the probability that Alice plays one is p one a, p two a for move two, and so on. And so these probabilities are, for example, initialized as one over n. They play completely randomly. And then as the, the game evolves, they're going to learn a little bit about the game and try to be better. So the evolution of these probabilities are given by the so-called Sato-Crutchfield equation. And I'm not going to describe these equations in detail, 
What they mean is that Alice and Bob are trying to estimate the, the performance of their moves from the past payoffs they've received, okay? And so they're going to average their payoffs over some time scale, one over alpha in the past. And from that, they are going to try to know whether strategy I is better than strategy I prime. And then they're going to make the, these probabilities evolve following these logic rules, which are standard in decision theory, and they're very similar to Boltzmann weight in physics. So they have estimated gains for each of their strategies, and they're going to, to play proportionally to the exponential of beta times this estimated gain. So beta is a kind of mixing parameter or inverse temperature in physics or irrationality parameter, which means that when beta is zero, they're going to continue playing one over n randomly. And when beta goes to infinity, it means that they only play the strategy that seemed to have performed best in the past, okay? So the question that uh, Galen Farmer asked is, what is the long-term behavior of this game? You see, it's very reasonable. That's the way people would rationally try to learn about uh, their environment. And again, I'm assuming that the payoff matrix is stable, which is a very strong assumption in, real, uh, in the real world. And what you find is that in the alpha, so alpha, remember, is the time scale over which you forget uh, what happened in the past, one over alpha, and gamma, the cooperativity of the game, you find a region where economists are right. The, the, the system indeed converges to a unique point, which is, in a sense, the Nash equilibrium that economists uh, describe. But in other cases, you find you know, this complexity that I was talking about. There's a variety of either multiple fixed points or chaos and so on, so you never learn anything. The second um, uh, game I want to quickly allude to is in honor of uh, Giorgio Parisi, uh, and it's what we call the SK game. So it's, it's a uh, work that is in preparation with Jérôme and, and Mikael. So here, instead of having two agents and n strategies, we're taking the kind of dual uh, case where we have n agents, a lot of agents, a big society like this room, I don't know, but each of us has to play two strategies, like, I don't know, uh, you know, buying or selling the stock market or uh, transitioning to uh, a green energy or whatever. And the gain of agent I when others play SJ is given by this combination, which is uh, the SK Hamiltonian, except that the interaction matrix JIJ here doesn't need to be uh, symmetric. So this is an influence matrix. It means how much does the action of J affects my gain when I play SI, okay? So this is a kind of generic interaction matrix between the decisions of agents and the payoffs. And so, so some of my peers are going to be in competition with me. Others are going to be cooperative. So in a sense, it's a, it's a very stylized but very plausible model of how uh, the economy is, is working. So again, we use the Sato Crutchfield equations for uh, the probability to play plus one or to play minus one for agent I. And what we find is that the fixed point of this dynamics is given by, is characterized by the probability to play one or to play minus one. So you see that because SI is only plus one or minus one, to describe this probability, I only need to know the average value of SI, which I call MI. So if, so if I know MI, the probability to play plus is one plus MI over two, and the probability to play minus is one minus MI over two. And what you find is that this, these, what we would call magnetizations in, in a, in a um, magnetic problem, they, the evolution is, going, is given by so-called mean field, naive mean field equations. So mi of t plus one is the hyperbolic tangent of sum of a j of mj of t. So the fixed points are given by the solutions of this equation. And what you find is that if the rationality parameter, if the mixing parameter is too small, so if people tend to play at random, 
then there's only one trivial solution to these equations, which is all MIs are zero, so people continue play randomly. So there's no there's no speciation, if you want. There's no uh, strategies that emerge. It's just uh, random. But if people kind of learn, that is, if they focus more on, on what worked in the past, then the some non-zero MIs emerge. But the problem is that there's an exponential number of solutions to the to these equations. And furthermore, the states that are reached by the dynamics are marginally stable in the sense that I've talked about earlier and chaotic with respect to the JIJs. So it's really a situation that I'd like to call a radical complexity. That is a model, a learning model that converges to an unknowable fragile equilibrium. You know, it's, it's also related to these ideas of self-organized criticality and you know, some ideas from the minority game, which I'm not going to describe, but for those of you who know the minority game, there's a, a, a smell of that as well in the minority game. And the problem is that in this problem, at least up to now, we don't even know the measure, the probability measure of these equilibria. So we don't know anything in the end. We know that the system is, people are going to learn, but we don't even know what they are going to learn. Okay, good. So, well, in these worlds, it's extremely difficult to say anything. And uh, I'm uh, pointing you to a, a book, a recent book on radical uncertainty. And uh, I've tried to relate radical uncertainty to this idea of radical complexity that I've just talked about. So I recommend this book if, if you're interested. And let me uh, finish by a few remarks. The first remark is that it's a kind of daily observation, unfortunately, that we we don't agree. We, we don't agree on anything, actually. Any, any problem that you ask people about, they are going to disagree. It's a, it's a little frustrating, but it's like that. You, know, you speak nuclear and energy, some people agree, other people disagree, and so on and so forth. And by the way, this is actually why there are financial markets, because this is a way to try to discipline a little bit the disagreement between people and try to make something emerge and have people have skin in the game when they say something you know anyway um so the, the reason i think that we we never agree is that problems are generally complex and set, sensitive to parameters or specifications so you know we we find het heterogeneous satisfying solutions and in some cases as i've said of unknown measure and the fact that people take different decisions adds a kind of intrinsic noise to these uh, problems. As I've shown, learning is no way out uh, from this uh, predicament. I've uh, discussed marginal stability, um, the importance of many equilibria. You know, if you have a single equilibrium, like in many economics model, then policy, monetary policy, for example, only is only there to speed up, for example, the relaxation to equilibrium, but it cannot change the equilibrium per se. If you have many equilibria possible in an economy, then policy and politics matters much beyond just stabilization of the supposedly unique equilibrium. So what to do, you know, what to do in such a world until we have much better model, more data, what, you know, what can be done scientifically? Well, let me discuss things that I believe are important in this uh, uh, direction. One is that you know, we should favor identifying scenarios, even if we don't have the probabilities associated to these scenarios, uh, to predictions that pretend to be quantitative, but are based on completely wrong models and completely wrong intuition about the world. And here, I really like what John, uh, Keynes said Again, you know, he's my one of my heroes, said it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. So I think this is really important. We should, you know, have a, a picture that is reasonable and intuitive about what can happen, even if we don't know what the probability of what that can happen. And in order to do that, one has to identify mechanisms at play, in particular, these destabilizing feedback loops and systemic instabilities. So I talked about black swans. But actually, you know, many of the black swans, many of the events that we've seen in the past, like the 2008 crisis and so on, that people call black swans that are, you know, supposed to be things that nobody had 
uh, that were intrinsically unknowable that nobody had seen in the past and nobody could predict. But actually, you know, some of these black swans may only be gray or even white. If, if we have the right picture of what's going on in the world, uh, 2008 is not such a big surprise. And there are many of these crises that cannot be predicted in the sense of knowing exactly when they're going to happen. But at least, you know, the, the mechanisms behind these crises can be identified. And it's no wonder that at one point they realize. I've spoken about this. I think that the idea of the trade-off between efficiency and fragility is, is really important in the world we are in now. We should quit this obsession of optimizing agents and you know, think about resilience with kind of buffers that make us lose efficiency. Buffers are costly, but they improve uh, the stability of the system. And finally, I think that you know, if we identify mechanisms at play, it becomes more uh, easy, I mean, not easy, but at least feasible to imagine precursory signals allowing one to anticipate nasty collective effects. And on this point, I want to remind you something that Bob Lucas in 2008, Bob Lucas, not a Nobel Prize in economics, said after the, the 2008 crisis, he said, well, the 2008 crisis was not predicted because economic theory predicts that such events cannot be predicted. End of story. And I think this is really not a good answer. And actually the queen itself, the queen of England itself, asked the question to herself, uh, ask a question to economists, why don't why didn't you see it coming? And she was not satisfied by this answer. So I think we should do much better. And on that note, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jean Philippe, for a really awesome talk. I'm uh, I have myself like a thousand questions to you, but. I'll let the audience uh, question you. So any questions or comments on Jean-Philippe's talk? There's one over there. And one over there, okay. Whoever reaches, and then it's you, okay. We have plenty of time, so go ahead. Yeah, you there. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. Um, I, I'm, I'm not in the field of economics and uh, of economics, so I, I'm just curious because you you also own a, a company, you know, uh, and how does it work to apply this or do you apply these ideas in your company and what are the reactions of your clients and how does it work? Because then like this, you no, know, as scientists, it, it seems wonderful and it makes sense. <laughs> But <laughs> so this is my question. Thank you. So thank you for your question. First of all, let me tell you an anecdote. So I gave a, a similar talk in honor of Giorgio Parisi last week at the Academy des Sciences. And Alain Aspect, the, the recent Nobel Prize, as you know, asked more or less exactly the same question. So, uh, um, so I'm prepared for that question. So, so let, let me tell you, first of all, that maybe CFM is a strange company in the sense that we have a strong association with academia. We've always uh, published pa scientific papers, even when they are very far from the day-to-day -day work. This has been, uh, uh, CFM exists since 1991, and it's always been, this, not a strategy, but the philosophy of the firm to contribute to the academic debate. So um, I think that CFM has published 200 pu uh, scientific papers in the last 30 years, which is not bad for a private company. So, you know, the question of applicability of your ideas is something that can be dangerous because if you don't do blue sky research, then you don't innovate either. But of course, there's a trade off because if you're only blue sky, then you don't do anything either. either. So that's the challenge that we try to match every day to, you know, make sure that people progress in what they, are, they have to do, but also think uh, outside the box and more widely. So what I've talked about today has no direct application to what we're doing, but it's, it creates an atmosphere where people think about you know, how financial markets work, how people in financial markets uh, behave. And this is very important if you want to build strategies that are 
able to um, capture behavioral anomalies. You know, in the traditional economic setting, making money on markets should not be possible. Markets are supposed to be efficient, which means that all possible information is already captured by the price. So there's nothing new that you can add, and the only thing you can do is you know, lose money by trading and, and, and losing costs to your intermediaries. But so the only way you can you know, do better than the market is by arbitraging, quote unquote, information that's not correctly included in prices. And having these pictures of why it's so difficult for people to uh, work out what's going on in the world is something that helps, I hope, researchers at CFM to imagine what they are supposed to imagine. Uh, there was a question over there. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the talk, Jean-Philippe. Uh, I'm Joseph Perello from Barcelona. I have ah, been I for a while on that. And I have a very specific question that also resonates with the previous one, that is uh, in financial markets and in this macroeconomics or economic analysis is quite dominated on artificial intelligence and this kind of algorithmic trading, for instance, and how this can be combined on, in relation to what you are just mentioning here, or whether this kind of approach is compatible or at least is in conflict in the current way of understanding these kind of solutions. And, and, and particularly, for instance, in the case of you mentioned efficiency versus fragility, that I think that might be something that, uh, that should be taken in real care when you do this kind of algorithmic sure. trading, for instance. So, you know, this is, a, again, a, a very long question. I think that financial markets are not dominated by algorithmic trading. Uh, it's it's the, the wrong idea. I, I think that what you have to imagine is that financial markets is an ecology with very different types of animals. And the big flows are not due to algorithmic trading. It's still a very, very small part of what's going on. I mean, part of the algorithmic trading is what people call market making. That is high frequency trading, for example, you know, people that are supposed to do in and outs at the millisecond time scale. It's really the wrong picture. These people have always existed. They are providing liquidity to much bigger fishes in the markets. And these bigger fish, fishes are still, as we speak, mostly um, uh, human traders and people who have... Uh, um, we try to treat real information, so to say. So I think that you know it's it's when one should be very careful in identifying the different species in this ecology and understanding where are the flows coming from. And it doesn't mean because you're trading fast doesn't mean that there's a big flow in, associated to you because you're you're only kind of intermediaries between bigger fishes, and that's I think most of what people call algorithmic trading is about. So, you know, I think that if you look at the statistics of financial markets, which is in a sense uh, a trace of what people do and how they act, it, the surprise is that financial markets in the beginning of the, ninth, of the, eighth, of the 20th century, um, or even before, because we have data before, uh, and the markets now have very similar statistics. They have, as you know, you say they have parallel tails, they have intermittent behavior of volatility and so on and so forth. And it's not only at the qualitative level, sometimes even quantitatively, these things match. So it means that nothing much has changed, actually. Markets have become electronic, but behind these, uh, these technological progresses, there are still these humans, these behavioral um, biases that emerge in financial markets and that we have to understand in, in, in order to introduce these buffers that I talked about in an efficient way. So, I mean, maybe it's paradoxical to say buffers in an efficient way, but if you want to, for example, avoid that markets go haywire, then you, know, you should understand where these liquidity crises come from and what's the best way to cure them. Uh, it seemed that there was some other question over there, yeah. <clears throat> oh, thank you for the talk, really interesting. And this is maybe a bit of a topic at more sociology of economists, but 
you are implying that economists more or less uh, have wrong or not clear picture or biased pictures of how the system works, yet they operate under these assumptions and more or less works or there's a dynamical Do you think system? they work? I, I mean, what's, what is working? Uh, that's another... Well, that's still... the point. I mean, if you have someone saying this, I don't think it works. Um, can you so if you have agents that have the assumptions that you are putting, how would the whole we the whole market will restructure itself? Will it change dramatically, or we just more or less uh, function in a similar way, still having the shocks and the uh, yeah, burst and uh, well, bubbles and burst? And yeah, that, that's related, I think, to Josep question. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think you know, financial markets is still not the biggest of the of, of, of the problems that economics face. I think that there are bigger problems uh, like you know macroeconomic cycles and so on. The organization of firms, the organization of the economy, especially in a world that is going to be changing in the in the coming years uh, because of the energy transition, for example. So you, you really have to understand how the system works. And assuming that firms make decision on a rational basis by optimizing their future cash flow, I think it's completely wrong. I think you know firms they overreact, they underreact, they have panic, they 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 just you know they do systematic mistakes in their assumptions. I know for running a firm for twenty years that it's we're not rational. We're using rules of thumb. We're like doing this and trying to do the best we can. So you know to say that on aggregate we are describable as if we were rational. I don't know where this comes from. It's just a leap of faith. We know that aggregating, so in the simplest case, you know, the, the, the simple argument that economists give for that is that is a kind of central limit theorem that we all do mistakes, but on average, these mistakes vanish. But, you know, we tend to do the same mistakes. And instead of vanishing, this can amplify and turn the system into something very different from uh, the behavioral of individual elements. So that's that's what physics, statistical physics is about. Phase transitions is about understanding how the same H2O molecules can be liquid or can be uh, so ice, solid, upon a very small change of temperature. And I think that the same is true for economics. That's, for me, the, the, the most important problem to solve in theoretical economics, but of course, you know, economists would pile on me, <laughs> is this aggregation problem. Well, I'd uh, certainly love to continue the debate, but it's only five minutes to the time at which uh, the satellite should begin. So uh, I'm going to uh, stop it here. And I'm going to ask you to thank uh, warmly Jean-Philippe again. Thank you. So as I said, now it's time for the satellites. There's very many exciting uh, ones. So please find yours. Uh, located in the building, and uh, all of you enjoy them. Thank you. I, I, I have to...